All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the one that you've all been waiting for, the speedrun breakdown for Vow, our fifth one in this series so far. Very excited to talk about this record. Vow is a very in-depth raid when it comes to strategies. All four encounters have a lot of cool stuff going on, and uh, I'm glad a lot of you have been very excited to see what's going on about the disciples. So, um, you know, let's get started. Let's jump right into it, and let's take a look at my POV of Vow of the Disciple. So. Let me go ahead and change that quality setting so it's nice and high. There we go. And so right off the rip in entrance, we have to kill this Savathun projection, right? So we experimented with a couple different options. The best one that we settled on that allowed us to be on swords and kind of not worry about heavy ammo too much was just everybody on Izzy. We got a Radiant Melee with one guy on a sniper, which is Ashura, and Crew, who is our hunter, he just jumps forward, swords forward, starts divving the boss, and we all aim kind of center mass. The div bubble, you can't really see it, but it is there and you can shoot it. And there you go. So right after that, you're going to see one person in our fire team, Crew specifically, he gets off a sparrow and he does something called Hunter Entrance. So if you're not aware, you can start Vow's cart section early by having someone get there early. So it detects the first player to get there and it starts spawning in the ads. And of course, if you spawn in the A-bombs faster, you can kill them faster and get knowledge faster. So Crew's job here, because the Warlocks don't have their wells, there's no rally flag. He's a hunter. Hunters can shatter skate without any rally flag, any super energy. So he goes straight to the cart as quickly as possible in about 30 seconds from the very start of the raid. And we're going to just skip over here. If you're interested in seeing his entire route, the uh, link to his run and the video in, in, from his run, his POV, is in the description as usual, the speedrun.com link. You can see any of my teammates POVs in there as well. I will be switching to some of my teammates POVs here just so you can see a little bit better. But you know, this one is kind of just you know a 20 second hunter entrance route. You can imagine kind of what's going on. So he's going to make his way to the cart and you'll see that everybody starts getting darkness the second he makes it there because the ads are already starting to spawn in. He's going to help us kill a couple of the A-bombs by himself and then we are going to help him kill the rest. Speaking of A-bomb kills, you might be wondering in a speedrun, you know, these A-bombs have a fair amount of health. How are you guys killing them quickly so that you can pick up knowledge? In this specific strat, this record, uh, we used Syntho Titans, so Syntheseps Titans with Seismic Strike and 1-2 Punch. We use T-Crashes in some cases, and we use Horsemen in some cases. In the current strats, in the current record team strats, um, we are using uh, Grapple Melees, Frenzied Blade, Parasite, and Horsemen as well in some cases. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what this first stop looks like. So the first stop, we go ahead and kill the last A-bomb, and you'll see that everybody kind of springs into action, and everybody kind of picks up their own knowledge. There's nine knowledge at each stop, and we try to distribute all the knowledge so that everybody can kind of pick them up quickly and arrive at the cart kind of at the same time. Now, you'll see that Crow is going to arrive, he's going to dunk his knowledge, and if you're observant, you'll notice that for some reason, the cart is not moving right away, despite the fact that everybody who has knowledge has been sitting on the cart for a while. And the reason for that is, Bao's cart operates on a frame roll. We talked about this in Garden of Salvation. What a frame roll is, is basically, in order to preserve resources and not, you know, check for things every single possible millisecond, a game will usually process certain conditions at certain frame intervals or certain time intervals. So for example, in Garden, in the first room, we talked about how in that stair room, when, you know, when the encounter is trying to spawn in an angelic, it's only going to check if you've killed enough ads every four seconds. The Vow card is similar, except it's not every four seconds, it's every one second. So it will check, it will accept a new player's knowledge every one second. So if you have four players that have picked up nine knowledge collectively, then all of them, it will take a minimum of three to four seconds, depending on you know where you land in the frame, three to four seconds to, to actually get the cart to move and process all of that knowledge. So we looked at this and we realized, right? Well, what if there was a way to make it so that only one frame was required, only one player dunking was required to move the cart, right? And so this is technically possible, right? And it's not possible by having one person pick up all nine knowledge, that would be very slow, and one person can't hold nine knowledge, you can only hold three knowledge. So what was our kind of response to this? Well, the current strategies, let me actually go ahead and show you what that looks like right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this 533 entrance, right? Which is about 20 seconds faster than current record or something like that. So a lot of time saved from this new strat, and the way that it works is pretty cool actually. So we discovered that in fact, if you don't kill the third A-bomb at a stop, so this knowledge bear right here, notice he's been kept alive. If you don't kill him and you continue to dunk knowledge, right? Knowledge that you dunk will actually respawn. So you'll see Crow here, he's, he's sparrowing over that knowledge and he's gonna dunk it. 
And you'll see that after a while, it actually, well, you can't see it in my POV, but I don't have other POVs that's available, sadly. But after he dunks it, that knowledge will continue to respawn until the A-bomb is killed. So what we actually do now is on the first stop, we pick up a total of 17 knowledge, okay? We pick up nine initially to dunk them, and then instead of immediately dunking the ninth knowledge so the cart moves, we pick up all of the remaining knowledge on the field so that we as a team collectively have nine, and then one person dunks, okay? So how does that work, right? You have nine knowledge required to fill up the cart. So we dunk eight, and then we pick up nine, right? We pick up nine. And then out of that nine, we dunk one into the cart and the rest we take it to the next stop. Okay, so using that respawning trick, using that respawning trick, we respawn, 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 a bunch of knowledge until we've dunked eight. And then once we've dunked eight, like I said, there's respawns. So there's going to be nine on the field. We pick up all of them and only one of those nine that are on the field is dunked into the cart. And so doing this makes it so that the, the first stop takes a lot more time, but you'll see that at subsequent stops, let me kind of move on here, right? If we move on all the way, let me skip over. Sorry, this is going to be a little bit jarring. But if we move all the way over to second stop, right, you'll notice that everybody actually is sitting on the cart at the start of the stop. You see this div bubbles, this div beams behind me. Everybody is sitting on the cart. And that is because we are dunking our knowledge. You can dunk your knowledge in the cart at any time once the cart gets to a stop and starts doing drown in the deep. So we dunk all eight knowledge from the previous stop that we were holding over. And now the cart, believe it or not, is actually at eight out of nine knowledge already. So it only needs one knowledge to be dunked. And so you'll see that after I kill with the, this third A-bomb with my friend Tocto, I'm going to turn around and Zito is going to be the only one that touches the cart. One person is going to dunk one knowledge into the cart and it's instantly going to move. So we found out that perfecting this strategy and basically making the second to sixth stops very, very, very fast is worth it in, you know, for the trade-off of having first stop be kind of slower. Right? So every single stop after this is even faster, just like that, especially the final stops where we have people that are leaving on skip and stuff like that. We don't have as many people that can pick up the knowledge. It's much, much faster in those stops. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have to say for the stops themselves. Okay, I've talked about, you know, first stop respawn manipulation, um, using that kind of eight one split, one dunk, eight dunk early, eight pick up and use on the next stop. Let's talk about the end of entrance where some unique things are happening that you should probably pay attention to. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is, first of all, crew leaves and rejoins the fire team. We don't need a hunter in the fire team after this point, so he just comes back on a titan, which we need him for damage uh, on, on caretaker. So you'll notice that here in just a second, right, after fourth stop is over and, you know, I crash my sparrow and I dunk my knowledge, me and my friend Crow here, or sure, as he's called here, we are well lining somewhere. Where are we well lining? Well, we are in fact well lining to the end of entrance. So I actually just well line here to res him. And for some reason, Crow has decided to die in this random location in this corner, right? Why has Crow decided to die here? Well, this is set up for one of the most complicated but very cool skips in Destiny 2 pretty much history, right? Um, this was like the first recorded use of an IRB skip. Now, if you've watched Grasp of Avarice speedruns before, you've probably seen this as well used in there. It has a much cooler application there, much more fancy looking. Um, but Crow is basically, he is dying to set his spawn in a global coordinate system. So, if you aren't aware, we've talked about this in previous videos, but Destiny 2's raids, dungeons, whatever it is, all its activities are split up into load zones, okay? So for example, let's say you have maybe load zone one, you know, let, let's say load zone A right over here. And in between them, there's some like, you know, some hub areas that they share, maybe load zone C over here. But in reality, all three of these load zones, they share a common coordinate space. So technically speaking, A actually does cover this entire space, but the playable area is here, right? So you can technically go over here, right? But it would take you, you know, you would have to take some sort of out of bounds routing because normally Bungie makes it so that there's these transition zones where if you go through them, it makes it so that it overlays the next load zone, okay? So just know that all of these load zones share a common coordinate system. So if we take, for example, let's say zero, zero is right here, right? Let's use a Cartesian coordinates. Let's say it's right here. And then load zone B will also have something over here. And load zone C also has something over here, right? And maybe this is like two zero, right? Load zone A, B, and C all have corresponding locations that, you know, correspond to these same coordinates, zero, zero. 
So what does an IRB do? An IRB, what it does is basically if you die in load zone A and then you don't die after that, right? So you, you set your global coordinate spawn here and then you go to a load zone right here, right? For example, load zone B and then you die to the load zone boundary right here. It will actually spawn you at load zones A's global coordinates, but in load zone C. Right. This is a very, uh, you know, one of the most complicated skip techniques in Destiny to explain. Um, and it's called the interdimensional res breach. It has a very complicated name to, to match. If you're interested, you can watch uh, Froggy. Froggy has some videos about the interdimensional res breach and how it's used in other activities. But this was kind of the first practical application of the IRB in a Destiny 2 speedrun. So this is really, really cool. Now, this may not seem like much, but you will see that Crow is going to use this kind of death setting technique in between first and second encounter and i will this will be a callback so when we get to first and second encounter we'll talk about this but just know he is setting his spawn right now for a crazy skip that's going to happen later in the raid so me and crow we head back to uh fifth stop and we make our way there and fifth stop is done pretty much the same as normal so i'm going to skip past fifth stop and we're going to see one more thing that is happening that's a little bit special so you'll notice right after everyone has dunked their knowledge here why are crew and day job jimothy or ritz why are they going to the end where, where is everyone going you know kenny's going there i'm going there why is everyone leaving and going to the end of entrance that's not the last stop right that's the fifth stop that's not the sixth stop why is everyone leaving the reason why everyone is leaving is because in order to pull to first encounter right so a long time ago people discovered that you can get over this door right by heat rising over the door and you know maybe sliding your way over the crack you can get over the store in vow to make it to first encounter but when you got to first encounter people found out that when you left on skip and you shot the crystal to start first encounter nothing happened well, why is that? There is a retroactive checkpoint that needs to be hit at the end of entrance. So much like, for example, with a deep stone crypt, the end of spacewalk, there's a checkpoint that needs to be hit here in the hit there. There's a checkpoint that needs to be hit here. And in Destiny 2, there's a variety of different types of checkpoints. And this one is what we call a friendship checkpoint, which means it's a friendship door. Everybody in the fire team needs to be present at the door for the checkpoint to register. And thankfully, it is also retroactive. Retroactive is a classification. It means that you can hit the checkpoint early ahead of time. And when the time is right and the, the game checks for that checkpoint to be hit, it registers that you've already hit it previously. So it doesn't need to be hit at a specific time. So we all hit this checkpoint at the end of entrance here. And because we've all hit this, when Crow, who is our zero one skipper, wants to pull everyone to the first encounter, it will actually allow him to because the game registers that there's a checkpoint. It registers that everybody was actually there at the, you know, at the end of entrance and it, it thinks that entrance is over basically. So now that uh, we've kind of gotten this out of the way and all the whole squad is has kind of hit these checkpoints you'll also notice that there's these two skip povs in the top left and top right corner of my screen these two skips are respectively called 01 cp and 01 skip okay 01 skip is crow he is going to go all the way down to acquisition and he's going to start the encounter as soon as entrance is done okay 01 cp in order to actually pull to acquisition, not only do you need that friendship door checkpoint, but there's also another checkpoint behind the door when it opens. And what Hashira is doing in the top left here, he is just simply making it over the door so that he can hit that checkpoint as soon as the door opens, rather than waiting for the door to open and then going through the door. So you'll see that in just a second here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip past um, kind of the final stop. And you'll see that Crow is making his way to first encounter, right? You can see that you can see Hashira is basically just waiting behind the door for entrance to end and if we go and skip past right over here you'll see that right when entrance ends and that objective updates Hashira simply sparrows forward and or not even sparrows forward that's kind of like where the checkpoint is and immediately he gets joining allies which means he set the checkpoint successfully and Crow of course shoots the crystal to pull everyone to first encounter. Uh, if you're interested in seeing their specific routes and how they got where they are, again, POVs are in the description. You can see the speedrun.com link there. But now we're going to make it to first encounter. So entrance, pretty long encounter, right? Almost six minutes long. Now I suppose it's closer to five and a half minutes. And now we're finally in the first encounter of the raid. Now I know a lot of people don't like Val because of that payload section, but you can see how there's a lot of strategy that even goes into something like the payload section, which seems pretty boring. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it when speedrunning. So that's why it took so long to explain that. Now let's talk about first encounter. First encounter, um, 
it's not done that differently from how it's done in LFG, at least for the first two rounds. Now, in an LFG, you would typically have three runners and three defenders. And in a speedrun, you also have three runners and three defenders. However, in speedrunning, you have something called early running. Typically in LFG, at least from my understanding, most teams will have you people hunt for knights, all three knights are dead, and then the runners will all run at the same time. In speedrunning, we make this a little bit faster. We expedite the process by as soon as one knight dies, that knight's respective room and room side, so light or dark, is called out ASAP and then the, the glyph keeper is killed. So we're only waiting on that third knight, the third room, the third kill. Okay, and so the reason for this is because there are 10 knights in acquisition, right? There's 10, there's five on the left and five on the right. And fortunately, you can actually watch all 10 of these knights with just four people, only four people, even, you know, just four or five people, which means that, right, you can have someone leave to go run a room and everybody will still be able to cover all 10 knights and you can have another person leave. So you can have the first and second knights run early. Those people can come out and they can help with shooting symbols or opening the door for the people that need them. And only the third runner is going to need to be fast and going to need to, you know, actually help with the knights and then leave. Okay, so my role here is actually the third runner. I'm not the early runners for first or second. I'm going to be running for the third knight. Now you might be wondering, you know, well, if you're watching four knights, how do you kill them quickly? Well, it's pretty simple. We all just use Izzy. Uh, some people are on recombination succession, but for the most part, we're all using Izzy. Okay, so <clears throat> that covers night kills. That covers early running. I'm also going to cover pre-reading, which I'll do in just a second, but we're going to see what it actually looks like to run a third room. So as you can see right here, I kind of just kill a knight with Izzy. That's kind of how it looks like for everybody else in the encounter. We're just killing knights with Izzy. And right about now, I'm going to get a call out from my team. Or actually, I read that for myself. I also read right side since I'm on the, the bone, the top middle platform. And uh, I see it's brain. So I just instantly line into brain. And I'm here. And I wait for my teammate to call it for me. And I instantly just throw a nade where he spawned. And I turn around. I read the symbol. And my teammates outside are doing uh, the accept. So they are shooting the correct symbols. Now, something important to know is we have a strategy called pre-reading. Now, pre-reading is half the reason why letting people out and doing early running is a good idea. So early running means that one person who, let's say, goes into the first room is going to be out very early and they're going to be able to help shoot the crystal for people that need to go in and out of rooms. But the other thing that they can do is that every single round in acquisition, right? You have a middle obelisk, you have a left obelisk, or I should draw this properly. You have a middle obelisk, a left obelisk, and a right obelisk, okay? And now all three of these obelisks, every single round, one of them is going to have one correct symbol, one of them is going to have two correct symbols, and one of them is going to have three correct symbols. And because of this, you are actually going to be able to tell what obelisks might be the best ones to shoot early. And the reason for that is because every time you kill a correct glyph keeper, so there's three correct glyph keepers, one corresponding to each knight, every time you kill a correct glyph keeper, all of the obelisks in the encounter will reveal three symbols. When you kill two, you get six symbols. When you kill three, you get nine symbols. So what you can actually do is you can sit in the middle, right? And with your teammates, you can look at the obelisks currently revealed symbols, right? Maybe you have like stop on this, right? And you hear that stop is one of the symbols that needs to be shot. So then you would pre-aim at this symbol. And the second you see the obelisk awaits your offering, you would shoot the symbol. And if only this symbol glows, then you know it's this obelisk. So you would call left. And if the whole obelisk glows, then you know it's wrong. And then you would try to shoot another obelisk. So pre-reading is very helpful. Having early runners means that you have more people that can come out and help pre-read, pre-shoot these obelisks nice and fast. So we get these fast accepts and we can move on with the encounter. Okay. So uh, another quick thing here, every time you get an accept, you need to kill all of the ads very quickly. After you get an accept, you have 15 seconds to kill every ad in the encounter, minus champs, minus screebs. If every single ad in the encounter is dead, you will get the obelisk to resonate with energy, right? See that resonate line? That resonate line means that the next round is started and night spawning will begin again. If you are not fast enough and you don't kill any ads, every second you waste that you, you waste with ads alive after those 15 seconds, you're not going to get that resonate. So the ad clear is kind of important in this counter, but only after you're done doing symbol inputs. Okay, so that's it basically for the first two rounds. You have, you know, early runners, you have, you know, that late runner, which is me in this case. You know, we're killing knights, we're pre-reading, we're doing this and that. What about final round? Okay, so final round is a little bit different. Final round is we have six people at the start. 
one person leaves on skip, then we have five people, then another person leaves on skip, we have four people, and then another person leaves on skip, and we have three people. So we actually three-man the end of this encounter, and three people, not only do three people leave on skip, which is pretty rare in raid speedrunning, not only that, but these three people are leaving on three different skips for three separate purposes, and I'll explain that in just a second. Okay, so first of all, there's some role swapping that happens in this encounter. Uh, for example, Hashira, right? Hashira normally watches um, the knights that are back here that are on, uh, what is it, R2 and R3. Uh, they're kind of hidden right now. Uh, and so someone else has to take over that role because he's leaving on skip at the very start of this encounter. So he is, not sorry, not the start of this encounter, but the start of the round. So let me actually skip to third round. So yeah, right over here, you see Hashira has already started leaving on skip, right? And uh, I'm currently looking for a knight. So Crow, the 1-3 skipper, the 1-2 skipper leaves immediately at the start of third round. The 1-3 skipper leaves after the knights are dead. This is kind of the timing that we found to be best. 1-2 skip has a longer skip route than 1-3 skip and 1-2 CP. So we have them leave first because you only really need five people at the start of every round to watch all the knights. So. Crow is going to go ahead and help out with knights. Once he has killed the third knight, which I believe was his right over here, boom, he headshots it twice, and then he leaves on skip. And now there's four people left in the encounter. So what are the four people doing? Well, we still have an early runner during the end of first encounter, right? But we only have one instead of two. We have one person early running. We have three people do the remaining knights. Uh, and no, sorry, we have four people do the remaining knights, including Crow. He leaves on skip. And then those two people both simultaneously run the second and third night call, so the final rooms. And then the first early runner, they come out, and by then you only have one obelisk to shoot, right? So it might be mid, it might be left, it might be right. In this case, it was mid obelisk. So Crew's already out of his room, he's killed his Glyph Keeper, and he's gonna go ahead, he is going to solo the final obelisk while his teammates give him calls. So Crew's POV is in the bottom middle right now. This encounter, the end of it, is quite hectic in speedrunning. So you're going to see a lot of different things going on at the same time, but focus on this bottom middle POV. I'll explain what's going on in the other POVs in just a second. So Crew, he's soloing the final obelisk. His teammates are giving him a call. He goes S, Ghost, and the final symbol, which I believe is Love, and then he's done, right? So that's it for first encounter, right? There's some finishers that are being made. He needs to let his teammates out. But for the most part, that's it for first encounter. Now let's talk about the skips. Why do we have three people on skip? Well, the reason for that is one, two, skip. You need someone to pull you to caretaker, right? So that's Hashira's job. He's going to the caretaker door. He's going to shoot this as soon as he can, right? You need someone to hit the checkpoint between acquisition and caretaker. So there's a checkpoint in between acquisition and caretaker. You're about to see me hit it. So I'm going to go ahead and die to this load zone. Again, default spawn exploitation. We've talked about that in the past. If you die after hitting a load zone and you don't touch the ground or set your spawn, the game will spawn you in the default spawn location of that spawn. I just realized this raid has so much like tech and stuff that we've talked about before, but just it's all happening at the same time. So this is kind of like, a, like an advanced kind of kind of like a pop quiz, or I guess, or like a test of how much you've been paying attention to the other tech that we've been talking about in the other raids, because Vow has a lot of stuff going on. So yeah, again, a triple skip, you'll see that I spawn in the caretaker load zone, which is called collection. And as soon as that objective updates, I well line into the wall, I hit that checkpoint and I die. And the reason why I die is remember garden, I'm doing something called a death warp. And so what does a death warp do? When Hashira starts the encounter right about now, my res gets teleported to, you guessed it, the starting area of the caretaker encounter. Okay, so that's what a death warp is. We've talked about this before, but it's just an example of me doing it again here. Now, you might be wondering, so the two people on skip makes sense, right? One person needs to go to caretaker. Good, makes sense. One person needs to die and hit that checkpoint and gets pulled to, you know, first the second encounter. That makes sense. Why is Crow on skip? Okay, now you might have noticed that Crow is, for some reason, creating some sort of stasis crystal, you know, structure here. Right, what is he doing? He's using Salvation Script. This is old Salvation Script, but why is he doing this? Okay, the reason why Crow is doing this is he's doing something called a death to load. Now, we've talked about dying in the load before, right? Which is just hitting a load zone and then dying quickly. Dying to load is a different thing, okay? Dying to load is basically when you enter a load zone and the game doesn't really know where to put you, right? The game doesn't really know where to put you and where it wants to put you is somewhere obstructed, right? And because it's obstructed, you die instantly. So in the case of Crow, he is blocking the area above his body as well as the area next to his body right at the border of the load zone. Do you see that? So he's going to shoot a crystal above 
where he's planning on entering. He's going to shoot a crystal behind where he's planning on entering. And that creates this tiny, tiny, tiny little space that he's going to crouch and slowly, slowly inch his way into. And if he hits it just right, boom, you see that? He instantly died and he got this loading thing on his screen. So he's actually going to get auto rest while he's in his inventory here, right? He has to die again. So boom, there you have it. He's dead. And now you'll see in just a second when he respawns, I'm going to, you know, he has to respawn a little bit here. Otherwise he's going to get pulled back to caretaker. So now he's going to respawn and boom, where is Crow? Where is Crow? In fact, let's go ahead and look at his POV because I feel like this is going to be something you want to see on the big screen. So let's go ahead and let's skip to wherever caretaker is, which is I believe like 946, somewhere on there. Yeah. So you'll see in just a second here, let's actually skip a little bit past here, right? They're in the caretaker encounter and Crow's going to respawn, right? Where is he? What the hell is this? Crow is on a floating staircase out of bounds in the caretaker load zone and yet his all of his teammates are what appear to be miles and miles and miles away from him where is crow that's a good question well corolla and crow credit to them they did a lot of exploration trying to figure out where in entrance you could set a spawn that would correspond to a useful location in caretaker for a skip and for whatever reason we have the tools today we didn't have the tools back then but we have the tools today to see in different load zones what coordinates correspond to what things so for example in load zone a like we talked about in load zone a right let's say there's like a statue here right in load zone b right if i change my pen color in load zone b in the same area right there might not be a statue maybe there's like a pillar instead or maybe there's like a, a rally flag right so two different things may be in the same set of coordinates right in the same coordinate location um and load zones overlap right so th they have areas where you kind of have two different you know two different kind of locations, I suppose, two different spaces, two different properties, but it's the same coordinate, right? And so Corolla and crew, or not Corolla and crew, Corolla and Crow spent a lot of time kind of examining what would be a useful spot in entrance to set your spawn, set your death point, so that when you did this kind of IRB, this death to load, you would spawn in somewhere useful. And they found this random floating staircase, right? This staircase is just completely random. It's like a leftover dev thing, right? And it's just floating there randomly up in the sky above everything else in caretaker out of balance but it just so happens to be useful for this one skip in the vow of the disciple speedrun right so just an absolutely crazy coincidence that this happens to be past the caretaker final stand floor part of the reason why you can't skip from caretaker to exhibition so you could do two three instead of one three is because the final stand floor is basically completely blocked off by a bunch of invisible walls floors ceilings okay and so what this what this kind of staircase does is that it's out of bounds and it's completely above that final stand floor barrier so you can completely skip past that and just go straight to exhibition and if we go ahead and watch crow's pov that is in fact exactly what he's going to do so he's going to be floating 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 for a very very long time he is very very far away from the encounter right now so he has to actually pop heat rises and float very very high up this wall all the way all the way up this wall i'm just I'm actually going to skip this because he floats for like 20 seconds right he's gonna land right here and you might notice this if you've done the two three skip out of bounds in like a vow lfg or you learn this by yourself you might recognize this area oh wait this is the end of the jumping puzzle this is actually the up out of bounds above the end of the jumping puzzle for the end of uh you know the vow jumping puzzle on the way to third encounter but crow is actually going to go inbounds and he is going to wait at this friendship door which is right over here i'm sure you know that this door won't open in vow lfgs you know or anytime you do vow until everybody's at the end of the jumping puzzle so when caretaker dies everybody leaves the fire team and crow sits here until the door opens on his own and he kind of just sits here and waits for the boss to die which the boss is about to die the objective is going to update the door is going to open behind him and he's going to be able to make it to exhibition now i'm gonna have to whiplash you back to caretaker because of course caretaker still needs to die crow doesn't just get to skip the encounter and um why don't we go back to caretaker so caretaker Caretaker is pretty cool, right? So first of all, symbol running is not too complicated. We basically have three different symbol runners, each of them getting three symbols. Everybody's on a sword to make sure things are nice and fast because the faster you do your symbols, obviously the faster you can get to damage. So we're going to see me. I'm just going to grab my three symbols. Uh, we have preferences for getting certain symbols in certain uh, locations so that it's easier for the final runner to kind of have, uh, you know, predictable pathing. So here we go. You know, I just kind of shoot my three symbols. Crew is getting his symbols. He's on his way out. And so, um, 
This encounter, for me at least, I had to do a lot of armor swaps. This was back when Charged with Light was still in the game. Um, I actually have a supercharged and charged up set right now, so I can get five uh, charged with light. And then I switch to a set with five firepower. So I have five firepower on right now. You notice my stacks are going down one by one. And this basically allows me to throw massively powerful death throws boosted, Verity's brow boosted, fusion grenades uh, at the boss. And the reason why we use grenades on this boss is because Vow has a special mod, a raid mod called Into the Light. And Into the Light basically makes it so that if you don't have any stacks of Pervading Darkness, so shooting missiles is really important here, if you have no stacks of Pervading Darkness, you do a shit ton of grenade damage, and you have a lot of grenade regen. It basically boosts your grenade DPS by 8 times if you account for the regen plus the actual damage increase. So we're doing our best work here to avoid damaging ourselves, getting damaged by bees so that we get Pervading Darkness, and we're also working on keeping our Verity's Brow stacks up, and the Titans are basically spamming Storm Grenades, this was pre-nerf storm grenades, like the old hoil storms that everybody used during that during season of the plunder. And um, yeah, that's basically what's going on here. We're just absolutely nuking this guy. We got some parasite. We got some grand overture as well to help out. And that's basically it. That's the caretaker one floor. Uh, if you haven't seen that before, you know it's pretty cool. You can in fact one floor caretaker. Um, there's mul multiple ways that have been kind of discovered on how to do it. Originally, it was done with a bunch of blade barrages back before blade barrage nerf. Um, then it was done with storm grenades and fusion grenades for a while. And now it's done with, of course, the flavor of the month, uh, grapple meleeing, because grapple melees are, of course, coded as grenade damage. So Into the Light actually buffs them a lot as well. And then final stand, um, pretty boring in, in, this, in this record. It's kind of just you got a div, we have some storm chasers, we have a wither horde, fusion grenades, whatever. Um, but we have five people during final stand, so it's, it's going to be a one plate no matter what. It's pretty fast. The, what we do in current strats, current record strats, current record team strats, is we actually duo or trio final stand. I believe we've settled on a trio. We're trioing final stands, and two people actually leave the fire team as soon as caretaker one floor is finished and we only trio final stand using like heavy GLs and so the other people leave and rejoin the fire team early so that they can start exhibition immediately as soon as everybody else joins the fire team and our ships dip okay um there used to be another strat where we would duo the you know the start of caretaker and we would rejoin in progress while exhibition was happening and spawn in dead uh, that strategy is no longer possible because we get error coded when we rejoin in the middle of exhibition for some reason now. So we had to kind of change our strategy, but I just wanted to let you know about the kind of innovations that are going on here because this rejoin is obviously really slow, so we wanted to figure out a way to kind of get around that. So that's basically what's going on in Caretaker. I don't believe I have anything else to talk about. Yeah, IRB symbol running one floor damage, final stand damage, and the staggered rejoins that I talked about. So that's it for Caretaker. Let's move on to exhibition. So exhibition. Crow is basically going to do this little transition. Once that friendship door opens, he's going to get here. We're going to pause. Uh, Crow gets a little hungry, so I put a little a little gif of a Crow eating a sandwich because, you know, he went to go get a sandwich uh, in the middle of our run. Um, yeah, still to this day, this is amazes me. He just, he just goes to get a sandwich in the middle of the run. <laughs> okay. So now, once everyone is spawned in, the timer unpauses on the first input. And now I'm going to blink forward. I'm going to place the flag. We're all going to rally and welcome to Exhibition. So Exhibition is one of the best speedrunning encounters in the game. You are constantly moving throughout this whole thing. Different players are burdened by relics. So you have to kind of do extra awesome, you know, add clear extra awesome damage to Glyph Keepers because some people are basically kind of um, crippled in this encounter, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, so a couple unique things that I want to talk about in this encounter. First of all, in every room that has two sets of Glyph Keepers, so anything but the first room, second, third, and fourth room, for the second set of Glyph Keepers, you only need to call the Scorn Glyph Keeper symbols. So the reason for that is because for whatever reason, right, the second callout, the second callout is guaranteed to be one of the Scorn callouts and only one of the Scorn callouts. So let's say the Scorn Glyph Keeper, the non-Relic Glyph Keeper, its callout drops, I don't know, Love, S, Hive, right? Then on the wall, you're guaranteed to only have one of those three, and it's going to be the correct one. So only, for example, S might be on the wall. So we, just in a speedrun, just to expedite things, we only call out Scorn callouts for the second pair of Glyph Keepers. So that's one thing you should know. Uh, I pointed that out because it's not something you're going to be able to see visually, and I'm not going to include the comms uh, in the background here. So that's just something you should be aware of. Um, another thing here, you know, we have basically all the players distributed equally. 
to trap these doors and spawn in the glyph keepers this encounter is extremely sensitive to ad clear you need to kill ads instantly and if you leak even one you risk not spawning a glyph keeper for a long time like wasting a lot of time waiting for a glyph keeper to spawn so we are basically nuking all of the ads uh, a change from record this record right now uh, that we're doing in the current record team strats is the person that does the one three skip so curls roll the sandwich guys roll um he actually completes his skip by going out of bounds and doing early second room using anarchy so instead of actually being with us and being at the flag to start the encounter he actually goes straight into second room and while we're doing first room he actually spawn traps all of the doors with anarchy and the reason for that is there's another unique quirk of exhibition the third encounter of vow um where the ads in the next room so let's say you're in room two right now the ads in the next room actually spawn the second you input the correct symbols of the previous room which means that you can progress towards spawning the first glyph keepers in every room already but before you even enter the room so let me show you what i mean by that we're at the end of second room right now right i'm going to input my symbols that my teammates have told me to input i'm going to go ahead and dunk a relic in here I'm going to res Ritz and I'll explain that in just a second, but notice here that as soon as this door opens, we already see Glyph Keepers start spawning. And the reason for that is because we have skippers that do something called early ads, okay? So just like how I mentioned Crow does early ads for second room, we didn't do that in this record, but what we did do is double early third ads, okay? And the reason why third room is such a great room to do early ads is because normally, I'm sure you're aware of this, but in vow there are groups of ads in exhibition where they get covered by a taken strength and they're immune and you can't kill them unless the taken relic comes and cleanses them fortunately for us in third room the ads actually spawn far enough away in these doors far enough away from the taken blight that they don't actually get immune and you can kill all of them and spawn in the glyph keepers early without the taken relic ever even being there so that's why early third is really really good but it also makes it so your skip is rather tight if you're late to killing the ads they'll become immune and you won't get glyph keepers on time so hashira and crow they're on time so we get glyph keepers on time now the downside to this is that because you have two people leaving on a skip they can't do relics right and so you have two relics that get deposited and then you need to pick up three relics and two people are not in the fire team so you have four people to do this and if you have four people to do this naturally you actually need five people to depot two relics and pick up three relics right and so because of that that's the reason why ritz died that's why i rezzed him he has to pick up two relics back to back because mathematically otherwise no one else would be able to pick up a relic he would be on lockout now you'll also see that i hit ritz here with a left click with my eager edge sword to send him flying up the left ramp and the reason for that is another skip issue. So, there's four rooms in Vow, right? One, two, three, four. And generally speaking, right, you have, you have two relics here, and you have three relics in both these rooms, right? So, in third and fourth room, if you have a relic in third room, then you're not a relic in fourth room. Now, unfortunately, right, Crow is one of the people that was doing early ads between second and third room. So, he does not have a relic in second room. He does not have a relic in third room, and Crow also happens to be our 3-4 skipper. So he is the person that's leaving in fourth room to go to Rolk, right? And because of that, he also can't have a relic in fourth room. And so this mathematically makes it really bad for us because it means that um, certain people are going to have to either double up on relics or we're going to have to wait out a lockout. So what, what is our solution? Well, I hit Ritz up the stairs on the left side of the room. He drops the relic for Crow. And then Crow picks up the relic for the second half of this room only. He dunks it in the transition room between here, and by that time, Ritz should be able to, you know, granted some circumstances, he should be able to pick up the relic and be a relic in fourth room again. So Ritz is actually a relic in all three of these rooms, okay? And the reason for that is because of the skip structure, but the skips do save more time than the time loss they cause of Ritz having to die and, and drop the relic. So here, pretty simple. Um, certain roles, of course, are on blink. For example, my role here is on blink. Um, in current record strats, we also have people on blink for very specific reasons. Because, for example, Taken can navigate the rooms very quickly without being on blink. Because uh, you can't really, uh, you know, do any, like, Icarus dashing or anything like that on Taken. And now we're going to make it to the final room. So final room. We only have one person leave on skip and that's going to be crow and you'll see that in the top corner of my screen in just a second i'm on blink on the laser relic because again you can't really uh use icarus dash or anything like that on the laser relic so blink is really helpful we kill this cliff keeper and then you'll see 
Crow is about to leave on three for Skip, which is going to be in the top right corner of my screen right now. He leaves and he goes to Rolk to open his cocoon and white pole the rest of the fire team. So fourth room, that's pretty much it. Um, record strats just have more optimized ad clear in this room. Another question you might be asking, right? So in current record, right? Or not in current record, in your team right now with the most recent cutting edge strats, you have early second, right? You have early third. So why not have early fourth, right? And that's a good question. Well, part of the reason is third room is pretty fast and the route to get to fourth room early is quite long. And so the likelihood of you being late is very, very high. Uh, compared to something like early third. Early third is already tight enough as is. The other thing, the other problem with fourth room, is remember how I said that in third room, the ads spawn far enough from oh, from the taken strength, the taken blight, so that they don't get immune immediately? Well, yeah, unfortunately, in fourth room, the ads spawn in the taken strength. On one side, the ads spawn in the taken strength. So even if you did do early ads, you would only be able to kill one side of the ads early, right? And so on top of being a treacherous route, on top of being kind of, you know, close in time, you're basically probably not going to save time. And on top of that, you would have to have another suicide between third and fourth room. And if you have to have another suicide in third and fourth room, that cuts into the time that you might save from even having an early fourth room to begin with. So we weighed our options and we decided it wasn't really worth it. Now, something that does change in our you know current strats compared to the strats that were used at the time, we actually have three people leave on skip to Rolk during this encounter. Okay, and so we actually trio with three relics the end of this encounter. We do our inputs and then we put all our symbols in. And the reason for that is because we realized that this wipe pull is really slow. Okay, so you might be wondering why, why would you wipe Rolk and pull everyone to Rolk using a wipe, right? Why not just get joining allies? Well, unfortunately, Rolk, for whatever reason, does not create joining allies. There's no joining allies in Rolk, there's only turn back, which means that if you were to start Rolk without wiping, and there's other people who are, you know, in the raid, they will just get turned back as soon as they enter the rogue load zone. So there's no joining allies, which means you have to wipe pull. Or we thought about this and realized, what if instead of having three titans rejoin the fire team, we had three warlocks rejoin the fire team, and we have six well warlocks, and everybody just does transition, does the three four transition to get to rogue. So that was the kind of, you know, the the kind of stroke of brilliance that we had. And it turns out it's a lot faster than wipe pulling. So we actually have three people do what Crow is doing right now. They skip to Rolk and they start the encounter as the rest of the team is actually doing transition to Rolk. So this is not something I can kind of visually display here, but when we submit our new record with, you know, new times, new strats, you'll be able to see it. It's pretty cool. The whole team does transition and there's three people at Rolk and they start the encounter and start splitting buff as people are landing from the transition and are in the turn back. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool strategy. Okay. So like I said, the two changes, the two major changes in exhibition compared to this POV of record that you're seeing right now is we do second room early ads, the 1-3 skipper does that, and we also do a late 3-4 transition. We have three people do early 3-4 or do like 3-4 before the encounter ends, and then we have three people actually do the transition after dunking the relics, right? So that's pretty cool. And the reason we have three people skip to begin with is so that we can start splitting, because um, you need three people to split, obviously one person to have the buff and two people to receive the buff from the split, okay? So you'll see here in this POV, we do a white pull. So Crow actually just kind of starts the encounter as quickly as possible. He spawns in the cocoon, he reses himself, and he dies. And you might have also noticed the timer was yellow there. There was a timer pause because there was an XP bug in the game during this time when we were running that caused Rolk to not be startable for a long time for some reason after the encounter, uh, after exhibition ended. But um, that bug is gone now, so it's not a problem. And um, now, yeah, we have this wonderful wipe screen. We're gonna skip past here and we spawn in. Okay, Rolk, final encounter of Vow. A lot of people love this boss fight, uh, although in speedrunning it's arguably a little bit more boring because you don't really get the dynamic movement that makes the fight so exciting. Um, but we'll talk about the mechanics. There's some cool strategies that I like to discuss. Um, but first, obviously, um, because it's Vow, because grenades do so much damage and there's no pervading in Rolk unless you get hit by a beam. Um, we do grenade damage. And so because we're doing grenade damage, I don't actually need uh, heavy ammo that much because I use a couple rockets, but I don't really need uh, heavy ammo. So what do I do? I just start the encounter right away without rallying. The rest of my team gets flag and we are off to the races. 
Now, Rolk, the splitting is done a lot different from LFG. In LFG, you probably have maybe two splitters, two dunkers, or maybe one dunker and two splitters, and you kind of just have the same people dunk over and over and over again. Not so in Rolk speedrunning. In speedruns, the way Rolk is done is, let's actually go ahead and look at a diagram that I made. I believe it's right over here. Yep. So this is the diagram that explains how Rolk splits are done in speedrunning. You basically split five times back to back with five separate players involved in the splitting and you have one player or two players actually double up and dunk twice. Okay, so that is pretty cool. The first beam is enough to cover these first two splits and then the second beam you have four more people that can get buff by that time. Okay, uh, the only other thing I want to talk about is in current strats we have one person on sword per dunk. And the reason for that is because the way Rolk works is every time someone dunks a buff, right, he will wait about four or five seconds for another person to dunk a buff, and then he will actually absorb those buffs and count them towards your total score, right? So let's say your, your score that you need is six for him to, to, to get him to go up, right? Um, he will add to that score five seconds after the first person dunks. So you might think that, you know, when you have two people with buff, you'd want them to go to the ones that would make it so that both of them dunk at the same time, right? So that both dunks are done fast. But no, you actually want the first dunk to be done as fast as possible. And as long as the second dunk is done within that five second time period, you want that time period to be started as quickly as possible rather than kind of balancing between the two. So for every dunk in current strats, we have a person on a sword to dunk as quickly as possible. And then the second person just needs to dunk in time so that they don't like it doesn't reshuffle and absorb the buff. Okay, so after doing three sets of two dunks each, right, Rolk is going to go up. Um, now, obviously, in, in, in current strats, like, three people don't get a flag at all. So we do need to mark the middle guy with Cenotaph. I don't think Cenotaph was even around in the game at this time. So that's that. Yeah, I think this was run during Witch Queen. So we're going to skip past this. We're going to talk about top dunks. All right, so this is the kind of bottom area. We're also saving a bunch of these ads here so that we can get Verity's Brow stacks earlier. Uh, or sorry, later, just like Caretaker, where we don't really kill the ads until damage can because you know, we need them to keep our stacks up. We don't kill these ads down here. I'm just blinding them with my empty vessel so that we can go up top and we can go do damage. OK, now Rolk Glaives are also pretty interesting. OK, um, you can kind of abuse Rolk's animation to speed up this encounter a little significantly. So a lot of the Rolk fight, a lot of the, the, the mechanics that he does up top, in terms of speedrunning, if we're looking at it from a speedrunner's perspective, uh, a lot of the bad things are his animations, right? Rolk is a very, um, you know, he's a braggadocious guy, right? He likes strutting around, taking his time, and his animations are really slow, right? So the more and more of them that you can skip by abusing certain parts of his kind of mechanics, the better. And so something you should know is that Rolk will always laser and keep lasering. He'll, he won't make any glaives as long as somebody has leeching force. Okay, how do you get Leeching Force? You break a Glaive. So if someone breaks a Glaive immediately, Rolk will not create any more Glaives until he lasers. So normally in an LFG, what that means is you'll do Glaive, Laser, Glaive, Laser, Glaive, Laser, Glaive, Laser, and finally, that's what, one, two, three, okay, so even more, right? Glaive, Laser, right? So this is what it will look like in an LFG. The way we do it in this current record is... There's something you should know about Rolk is that when he is about to dash and he's already created a glaive, you even if you shoot the glaive behind him, he will still he won't laser. He won't laser. He'll he'll still make another glaive. So you can make up to two glaives at a time before Rolk will you know start lasering you because he's not going to create any more glaives. So we call the strat two one one. So what does that mean? That means that Rolk makes a glaive. He starts to dash and then as he starts to dash, you shoot this glaive and this glaive will still be created. So you'll get that too. Okay, and then we have the 1-1, one, one, like I mentioned. So, um, basically, what does that mean? It means glaive, glaive. So you skip over this laser, and then you have a laser, and then you have a glaive, and then you have a laser, and then you have a glaive, and then you have a laser. So you kind of skip one animation's worth of time. Now, you might be wondering, what if you could skip all of these lasers? What if you could skip all of them and only have one at the end, and everybody dunks at the same time? That's a good question. Well, there actually is a strat, in, in the current strats that we're using up here that involves dying. So the way Rolk Glaives work for whatever reason is that if you break them from a damage source that comes from you, but you break them after you die, you will get Leeching Force, a symbol will be dropped, it'll register that the Glaive broke, and so when you respawn, right, when somebody reses you, you will still have Leeching Force, it will give you the buff. 
However, Rolk won't laser because he's you're not alive. You're not alive. No one is alive with leeching force, so he won't laser. So what do we do? We use waveframes and we shoot a waveframe at the ground. It travels across the ground and breaks the glaive. And while it's traveling, we rocket the ground and die. And we do this three times in a row. And only the fourth person, only the fourth person, they shoot the glaive normally, and everybody gets rezzed, and all four people get buff at the same time. So it's a pretty crazy strat. Again, not something I can really visually show you. I don't really have a clip right now, but you can imagine that it's a pretty cool strat. You know, you have three people that are basically dead, and Rolk never lasers, and then all three of those people get rezzed. He lasers once, and everyone gets buff. So you basically get to save three animations instead of one. So that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, so finally, I've talked about Glaive Deaths, which is a pretty cool strat, and we are finally going to get to damage. Now, damage is done pretty similarly in this record compared to what we're currently doing with our team strats, and that is nade spamming, right? So I have death throws. I've just very, very, by the skin of my teeth, just barely really gotten my stack refresh there, and I'm shooting the final roll crit. Boom. I rehone my Izzy, and boom, we just start to bake him with nades. Now, you might be wondering, how is Rolk not moving? Right? Normally, Rolk in LFG, he is dashing, he's prancing around, he's making these lasers, and of course, the lasers are really bad for grenade damage, right? Because if you get lasered, you know, you get pervading darkness, your into the light becomes deactivated, right? Well, we have Crow, right? Crow over here, he is actually just tanking the boss using healing grenades, using a healing rift. He is just tanking the boss and applying tractor, and that way the boss can stay nice and still for the rest of us while we spam and dump storm and fusion grenades into his unmoving body. Now, for final stand, also pretty straightforward. Um, in our strats, since we have six warlocks, we just kind of keep throwing nades at him. Uh, in this record strats, we save three T crashes. They're switching to Curus right now in their inventory. You can see the dot 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 next to Crew's head. He's switching to Curus, and I'm holding my trace rifle down because Rolk's final stand animation, it kind of starts randomly, right? So we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. I call that he is damageable now. We see the T crashes, boom, they all T crash into the boss, and he's dead. Okay? Now, I, this is, it's very late at night right now. I just talked for like, I think 40 minutes straight, but I hope you enjoyed. Uh, this raid is very, very dense. In my opinion, it is easily the most dense raid strategy wise out of any raid in the game. And um, I hope, you know, this kind of makes it clear why every single encounter has a lot of intricacy built into it, including even entrance. And the raid itself is also very long, right? It's one of the longest raids in the game. Um, if not the longest raid in the game next to something like Vogue. So um, yeah, pretty cool raid. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, a lot of you guys have been asking for this, so hopefully you are happy. And uh, next up, we're going to be talking about King's Fall. So get hyped for King's Fall. Really excited for that one. A lot of you guys have been asking for that one. That's probably the second most requested one behind Vow. So I'm excited to talk about that as well as discuss some of the new strategies. My team, which is currently running back King's Fall for a new time, um, we'll be talking about then. So um, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed and uh, I'll see you around later and, you know, leave a comment or a question if you have anything to say. Bye bye.